Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again uh, to another episode of our show, bringing you another awesome guest today uh, involved in creating a, a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Dr. Doug Athel, who is founder and chief executive officer of a company called Lucadia Therapeutics. Um, they are a, a preclinical stage company focused on diagnosing, treating, and ultimately curing Alzheimer's disease. And they've developed a, a really fascinating proprietary uh, medical device known as Arethusta. Uh, ultimately designed to help restore the flow of cerebral spinal fluid uh, through this er interesting area of the skull, the, the cribriform plate, to ultimately flush away toxins uh, from parts of the brain where Alzheimer's disease uh, has been known to first appear uh, during pathology. Uh, Dr. Thel received his PhD in uh, neurobiology from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, he was a human frontier science long-term fellow at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Psychiatry in Munich, a staff scientist at the Scripps Research Institute and uh, La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, and a uh, faculty member at the University of California, Riverside. Um, in 2017, Dr. Thel was professor of neuroscience and chair of the graduate faculty and head of uh, molecular neurobiology at the Western University of Health Sciences be before joining Lucadia full-time, and he's published dozens of peer-reviewed articles and presentations over the years. Uh, when he's not doing all that, he is uh, he's also an accomplished author. You can uh, pick up a copy of his uh, 2020 book, Remembering Apples, A Race to Cure Alzheimer's Disease, available on Amazon and all their major booksellers. But uh, we're honored to have him with us today. A lot of really interesting topics to get into. Dr. Doug Athel, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks, Ira. It's great to be here. It's it's great to have you, Doug. I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I was... Love to start off. I mean, I'm, we're going to be getting into Lucadia and Alzheimer's and all that, but I, the first place I would really like to go because I, I spent some time sort of swimming through uh, PubMed uh, and sort of looking at your sort of progression over time uh, mm -hmm. as you've you know developed in this space. And I, one of the most interesting things that popped out to me right away was that um, your PhD work uh, was not on this, but it was on another really fascinating CNS area, namely spinal cord regeneration, and you published on these really interesting components of uh, what you referred to as permissive and restrictive states uh, surrounding spinal cord regeneration. And I want to go here first, because I think some of these themes ultimately come to what we're going to be talking about a little later in terms of uh, what's permissive, what's restrictive in terms of the development of, of Alzheimer's. Talk a little about the early days and, and some of your early work in uh, in spinal regeneration, if you would. Sure, sure. I, I, as an undergraduate, I got very interested in regeneration, particularly things like salamanders can regenerate uh, limbs and, and even the brain can be transplanted. And I, I was wondering why that's the case in salamanders, but not in humans. And, and eventually I, I wound up working in a lab for my PhD where the, the main interest was the spinal cord. Um, and not just regeneration, but also how the spinal cord communicates with the brainstem and upper upper brain area. So that's really where the, the bones of the lab were from. And then we were working in regeneration. And, and an interesting thing we found out was that um, embryonic chickens um, can repair their spinal cord up to a certain point yep. and not after that. And so I spent my PhD looking at the biochemistry um, at that, trying to purify inhibitors while we purified some inhibitors of neurite outgrowth. And we, we, we scheduled you know, when this, this change occurs and 
and some of the factories involved in that. And it was it was very interesting. It was um, uh, revealing in that um, I, I think what I, I eventually came to the conclusion of was there's an evolutionary advantage to having these inhibitors yeah. in higher vertebrates when you have a higher cortical function because the the neurons are all with very few exceptions they're all made before you're born right and then it yep. they're connected and the the synapses are refined as you get older and you learn things uh some of them are trimmed away others are made stronger and and that's really how your brain learns and develops and the neurite inhibitors uh sort of prevent uh you know short circuiting of that Yep. Because uh, neurons will just inherently try to grow. They'll try to sprout um, a growth cone. So, so when a, the the output of a of a neuron, when it's sending a signal along, it goes down an axon, right? In saltatory conduction, if there's yep. myelin, but it moves down the axon and then it branches out into a synaptic field. And one of the things that's interesting is after that's occurred, then there's myelin around. Um, those those things and some of the the strongest inhibitors are in myelin because if you take a neuron and and the spinal cord for example if you take the spinal cord you take a piece of peripheral nerve where regeneration does occur and you stick it onto that albert aguayo and sam david did this these studies a long time ago um those axons will grow through the peripheral nerve because it's mm -hmm. a it's a permissive environment. Yeah. So they just normally do that. The problem is if, if you're trying to go around a spinal cord lesion, once it gets to the other side, it's in the same boat, right? The, the field's full of those and it doesn't have the signaling cues. It doesn't know where it's supposed to go. It's it's lost its roadmap because that that's a sort of a transient feature uh, during development. So the roadmap sort of disappears and the inhibitors come in and it prevents the system from going backward, right? So, so that's really seems to be the advantage of having these inhibitors. And so they they came along in evolution as, as brain function got more complicated. And um, to get around them, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a completely uh, fruitless pursuit. Uh, to the contrary, I think it's just a matter of figuring out how to uh, inhibit or suppress those responses to get some modest uh, spinal cord repair. Mm -hmm. But wh when I finished my PhD, and so, you know, I, I don't know if you did a PhD, but it's a, it's a bit of an arduous process, right? It's a, some tenacity is involved. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the end, I realized that for spinal cord injury, that's not just the inhibitors. There are other components that we need sure. to know. And one of them is survival neuron survival because neurons if they're insulted in some way if there's a ischemic injury where a, a blood flow stops uh, they'll tend to die so one of the important things is how neurons survive and the other important thing is how they contact the environment so the cell to cell and cell to matrix adhesion which is yep. integrants and cell adhesion molecules so I, I knew quite a bit about inhibitors, but I didn't know as much about these others. I mean, I obviously read about them. So I had an opportunity to do a, a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute with uh, Hans Tonin. Um, and he'd sort of played a major role in discovering uh, more than half of the neurotrophins that were around. And neurotrophins are neuron survival molecules. Mm -hmm. And so to gain some insight in that, I, I started working in, uh, in neurotrophins in Munich. And then when I, I finished that, I came back to um, to California to work with uh, Jerry Edelman, who um, got the Nobel Prize for antibody structure. That is, it's two polypeptides that link yeah. together and the immunoglobulin domain. And and his thing at the time was he discovered uh, NCAM, neural cell adhesion molecule, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some other cell adhesion molecules, which was another missing piece of the point. So I was still sort of on track to circle back and and do that um and uh I, I worked in scripts for a year and then the field of apoptosis really took off and it was very interesting sure. because it tied into cell adhesion it tied into survival signals and and probably spinal cord um injury mechanisms as well so um i i sort of worked with uh, uh another group there across the street basically um where they were 
they were quite well known and, and big names in cell adhesion or not in cell adhesion and in apoptosis. So I worked on apoptosis for a while. And that's where I really started working on the survival of neurons that were insulted by amyloid beta. Yep. So amyloid beta is the big thing in Alzheimer's. And so what I started doing was that I was working on a number of other projects as well, one on multiple sclerosis, one on 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 that. And then when I started my own lab at the University of California, Riverside, um, we worked on neurodegenerative disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, so we worked on Parkinson's and and Alzheimer's and uh, and MS and and a, a few other things, but the, those were the main projects. And we just sort of became more focused on on Alzheimer's disease over mm -hmm. the years. Um, and uh, and so the, yeah, the lab was working on that, and uh, we were doing the same stuff as everyone else. We were doing mouse models that had a mutant human APP amyloid precursor protein that makes EA beta mutant presenilin one, which is the the you know the final cut step reaction to making A beta, um, and and culturing neurons and treating them with amyloid beta, looking at the cell death pathways. Uh, so we were working on the same stuff that you know hundreds of other groups are working on. And when I I moved my lab to Western University, which is about twenty miles away, um, I. I started wondering, you know, why aren't we making any progress? I mean, this field has been, you know, flush with papers with the amyloid hypothesis for quite a while, but it's not that the ball's inching down the field a little at a time. It hadn't gone anywhere in 25 yeah. years. And so to me, that that smacks of a systematic error, right? There's something systematic that we're doing that's wrong. And, and this came sort of at the same time with... Uh, quite a few big clinical trials that were failing that were sure. around the amyloid hypothesis. And, um, and, and so we, we started working on, on that. And I, I sort of stepped back a little bit and I spent a good couple of years coming through the literature and looking at the field from, from the start and building up and saying, okay, what data do we have that has, or what ideas have data behind them, right? Because sometimes what happens is a big name guy will will say something in a review, some opinion, and everybody mm -hmm. starts repeating it, and then it's just taken as gospel with really no data to support it. Right. And an, an example of that would be amyloid beta, yep. right? It's this little peptide. It's 40 to 43 amino acids long, typically. 42's the toxic one. 41's less toxic, or 40's less toxic, and the extra two amino acids are hydrophobic, so it makes it less soluble, more likely to stick together and clump together. And so I remember, you know, for years, uh, people in the field would say, "Well, the human one is toxic. That's the problem. The mouse and 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 the rat one, it's completely different. It's not toxic." And so when we were looking at these mechanisms, we, we were looking at the gamma secretase inhibitor and how it's you know, that's where the presenilin one comes in. And it also does a lot of other important things, including blood vessel density. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went back and I said, well, wait a minute. I, I mentioned something, but there was really no data for that. So I, I spent a spent a day pulling up the protein sequences of every amyloid beta I could find from terrestrial, during terrestrial evolution, from coelacanth, you know, the lobe fin fish that came up on mud flaps to human and uh, turns out the human form is exactly the same as every other vertebrate, except for four, land animal, except for four. Mm. Uh, and that's rat, mouse, naked mole rat, and a marsupial nobody's ever heard of. Mm. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting that those are the weird ones, that mm. all of the Alzheimer's models rely on animals that don't even have the same one we do. So to make the, the mouse model and, and rat model, they have to put in the human one. Gotcha. But it's not that there's this, this nasty human one. It's a highly conserved peptide for 450 million years. It does something very important. And the field in Alzheimer's was sort of like, well, we just need to get rid of the A-beta and right. everything will be great. And my thinking, my thinking was, well, it, what does it do? I mean, it, it does something important. Maybe there's a consequence to that. And so our research 
uh, on that, we we looked at blood vessel density because the last cleavage step to make amyloid beta is the same one to cleave notch. Mm -hmm. Notch is a major regulator of blood vessel density. So if you inhibit the gamma secretase, suddenly you get lots of blood vessel branching. And unusual blood vessel branching patterns are something that we're seeing, was seen in the Alzheimer's mouse model. And so my thinking was, well, you know, if you just get rid of this, um, you're, you're going to have lots of other problems. And that turned out to be the case. There was a, a big study with gamma secretase inhibitors. And I remember the conference in 2009 where big pharma company, they had to announce the results of their trial. And it turned out that it was, it was very bad. It made the Alzheimer's patients not, it made them worse. And when they took the drug away, they stopped treating, giving the drug, they didn't rebound, right? They kept getting worse. And so that, that sort of consolidated my idea that, you know, we need to go in there or I needed to go in there and find out, you know, is there another path that we could have taken? Right. Where did we go wrong in this path? And so that led me to, um, you know, looking at the anatomy. And anyway, I, I'm droning on. No, no, no. Uh, you, you, you're, I, you're, you're, you, you, you went right to my second question. And because, you know, I saw those papers um, in, in PubMed on zebrafish and sort of the capillary bed densities and cerebrovascular deficits and all that stuff. And it's, again, like you're pointing out, uh, because out, you know, beta amyloid has been sort of the, the, the bad guy or the wanted guy on that poster for so many years, $30 yeah. billion dollars in, thousands of clinical trials. Maybe maybe we need to think a little differently about this. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, you started you, you make this awesome analogy about sort of the brain is this forest, and we got these creeks and tributaries and rivers and everything flowing through that is the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, um, right? At washing things away and clearing away metabolites and all sorts of other stuff that you know, uh, you know, but better than I do. Um, talk about sort of when you first sort of got an aha moment in terms of the CSF and a little bit of uh, how that uh, initial strategy sort of materialized in your mind. Well, working late in the lab one night, I was bitten by a radioactive spider. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, I I went back and started looking at the the anatomy because it's, it's well known, even in the mouse models, um, that the pathology really begins in the medial temporal lobe and, and the anterior temporal lobe. So in that structure, there's a hippocampus which is very important for making new memories. It doesn't store memories. What it does is sort of filter through things and find out what's novel. Mm -hmm. And so it helps consolidate memories farther up in the, in the cerebrum. Um, and in front of that is the amygdala. And so the amygdala is very important for, for our fear responses, right? Right. If you have a damaged amygdala or so a, like a primate with a damaged amygdala, they'll pick up a snake and look at it and put it in their mouth. And mm -hmm. ordinarily they would be terrified of it. So we have these two important structures there. Excuse me. And one of the interesting things is that the amygdala has a direct connection with the olfactory system. Okay. So it the olfactory system in the in the nasal mucosa, the olfactory epithelium, there are the huge receptors, the odor receptors. And they have an axon that goes up to the olfactory bulb, which are these two little lollipop structures at the base of the brain. And so the signal goes in there, it's processed, and then those cells, mitral cells, send an axon that goes all the way to the amygdala, which is a little ways away. It's a, a bit of a tortuous, tortuous path, tortuous path. Um, and, uh, and so there's a direct connection. And I remember when I was in grad school, um, some people suggested that there was an unknown virus causing Alzheimer's, right? That got in through the olfactory system and it was causing a problem because it was known even then um, that the pathology begins in the medial temporal lobe and basal forebrain as well. And then it spreads outward, right? And right. so it's it's kind of like a self-perpetuating pathology that seeds in this one area and then it spreads outward. And one of the confusing things for, for the general public is that it progresses differently as it spreads through the brain. So you have these different sort of phenotypes when people get Alzheimer's, sometimes they they sing, sometimes they become mute, uh, they don't walk very well, they, you know, have emotional outbursts, or they become depressed. It's that it's spreading outward from that area. It's sort of a stochastic way. And so it's affecting mm -hmm. some areas more than other in some people than others, but eventually it consumes the entire cerebral. 
but but it all starts in the same area. And so what usually happens early on is, you know, grandma loses her way home from the store in a neighborhood she's lived in for 50 years, right? And everybody's looking for her for a few hours. And then they go, well, you know what? There's, there's a problem here. And she's had, you know, problems remembering things. And the reason she gets lost is because the hippocampus also has place cells. So it orients us in three-dimensional space. So different cells fire depending on where you are in a three-dimensional, in a, in a room or as you're navigating through a maze. And so when those cells become deficient or defective, right, they're not firing properly, it's easier to get lost. And so that mm -hmm. often will happens early. So there's this connection between those. And the thinking, you know, back in the, the 70s, 60s and 70s was, oh, there's some unknown virus. And, and it was searched for endlessly and eventually it was no there's no virus there um so what causes the disease and so my 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 reading on it i i came to realize that you know there's there's something else here because one of the main features of alzheimer's disease really is the accumulation of amyloid deposits so plaques mm -hmm. Um, they're a little different than the plaques sort of come in two flavors. There's the diffuse ones that can appear all over the cortex without causing Alzheimer's disease. And then the plaques that are in Alzheimer's pathology, they're neuritic, they have dystrophic little branches around them, and they have some other features in there, you know, deposits of proteins and lipids and things like that, um, and inflammation around that area. So it's it's sort of a different pathology. And my thinking on that is that that's really, it's like a self-perpetuating pathology. So what happens is you have years where things have changed and it's percolating and eventually it can start to spread to other areas of the brain, which might take 10 years. And so when I was thinking about it that way, I, I went back because amyloidosis is something that also happens in the rest of the body, yeah. right? There are proteins that, that if you put them together by themselves at high concentrations, the protein will make this amyloid fold, which makes it less soluble. And so they'll sort of wrap around each other like carpet fibers together. And so those, those are the little fibrils. So really, first they're oligomers, right? Mm -hmm. A few of them together, then it forms fibrils and eventually plaques. And so the fact that there's amyloidosis elsewhere in the body linked largely to problems with the clearance of interstitial fluid. And that's the fluid that flows in between the cells. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what, what if that's the case in Alzheimer's disease, right? We're looking at not the cause, but the effects, right? Mm -hmm. With, with plaque. So what might be the cause of that? And so that's, that's how I got into the idea of, well, what clears the interstitia in the brain? Because it's different than it is, in the rest of the body most of the body the fluid that goes between the cells the interstitial fluid comes out of the smallest blood vessels so they have these little holes or fenestrations gaps between the cells they're small enough that the plasma can ooze out slowly very slowly but the blood cells just continue on in the blood vessel right mm -hmm. and so you get this this slow plasma coming into the tissue which is full of antibodies and, and it flows through the cells and it picks up metabolites and debris, exosomes, things like that. And it carries them away. And mm -hmm. in the tissues, uh, they're open-ended lymphatic vessels that pick it up. And it eventually joins the heart after going through the lymphatic system. And the brain, though, that can't happen. Because the blood-brain barrier protects the central nervous system from blood-borne pathogens. Mm -hmm. So the blood vessels in the brain, they have these tight junctions so that the plasma can't get in. But the brain still needs to do this basic housekeeping function. So what it does instead is it makes cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, okay. in these chambers or ventricles in the middle of the brain. And that percolates out through the tissue. And that's what clears away these things. So I, you know, thinking about that, I was like, well, what if Alzheimer's really were, we're talking about a disruption of this flow? Mm -hmm. What would happen? Well, what would happen is the A beta that's normally made sort of in a basal level, it's going to accumulate because it's not being carried away. And it'll, you know, toxic for some neurons, but probably also some other things are accumulating, right? Cytokines and signaling factors and exosomes and right. and, and whatever. And so I, that that sort of got me on to the idea of, 
you know, how does the CSF flow work in the medial temporal lobe? And it became clear to me that, you know, right, right next to those structures, right in those structures, is the horn of one of these ventricles, the inferior horn of the lateral temp the lateral ventricle. And so CSF comes out there yep. and then it goes through the tissue and it goes outward toward the surface, right? So the surface of the medial temporal lobe has this thin little volume in it called the subarachnoid space. And so the whole brain has this little volume. Yep. And so the fluid's going from the middle outward, right, to this area, and it's carrying all these things in it. And what happens to the fluid there is, is a little different depending on where you are in the brain. And the superior parts of the, the cerebrum, there are arachnoid granulations that, that sort of carry the CSF away, right? They're on, they have these arachnoid cells that make these little balls that go into hmm. a major vein and it goes in there. Now, that's, that's great, but you know what? That's an adaptation of primates, right? Only primates make these hmm. and most of them grow after birth. So... There's still CSF flow in animals that evolved before primates and in babies. So the thing is, the, the main outlet for CSF in most other vertebrates, land vertebrates for sure, um, is the front of the brain, right? Because we've got a little different shape. We've got this big, massive um, prefrontal cortex, which sort of took that structure and moved it down, right? So the the fluid that would normally be coming out the olfactory system in the front of the brain um, is coming out a little differently. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm I'm losing you here, but but the fluid is coming down from the medial temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. right? It's going along that fiber bundle that was connecting the olfactory bulb to the amygdala, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of loosely packed, and it's, it's loosely packed enough that fluid can flow through it. So it's not like a blood vessel. It's not a lot of fluid. It's it's sort of a slow trickle, right? So it's it's making its way to the olfactory bulb. And from there, where does it go? Well, it goes into the nasal cavity through this funny structure called the cribriform plate. Right? Okay. And so the cribriform plate is it's sort of a porous sieve. Uh, it's like a, a tiny little bone. It's got holes. For the odor receptors, they're, they're coming up to the olfactory bulb. They go through, they bundle together and you get these thick bundles coming up. And around those bundles are little channels that allow CSF to go the mm -hmm. other way, mm -hmm. right? And so this is really the original way that CSF was cleared from terrestrial vertebrate brain, right? Because, uh, you know, if you, you look at a dog or, or a lizard, you know, a reptile would probably be the best where you've got um, the, the front third of the brain has to do with olfaction, right? Fear and sense of smell, hunting predators and prey mm -hmm. and mates, all very important for survival. So almost the front third of a, of a reptile's brain has to do with that. So the, the cribriform plate is actually a cribro structure. It's almost like a cone at the front, right? And there's, there's uh, odor receptors coming in sort of from all directions because the olfactory system's more important for survival than it is in humans Got right it. and so this was the main sort of point of egress for for csf in the front part of the brain and what happened in evolution is that you know if during during primate and then hominid evolution um the dorsal part of the brain got to be bigger and bigger right and so this cone that was at the front sort of got pushed down into a plate right because there is a, you know, there, there's a turf war between an expanding prefrontal cortex and the olfactory system. So the olfactory system is nowhere near as important for us as thinking. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it kind of functionally, it won that. So the cribriform plate got smaller and smaller, and now it's a little, a little uh, plate. Well, from a sort of cone to to a little plate. Yeah. But it's still there. I mean, the structures that relied on it for getting rid of the CSF that they that cleared through at the base of the brain, they still use this. They're not going to sit around and have a committee meeting saying, "Oh, listen, we're gonna we're gonna send the CSF 
up to the uh, the yeah. top of the brain where the arachnid granulations will take it from there. No, no, they still rely on that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that system. And so what happens is when we get over 45, I mean, arguably we only evolved to live 40, 45 years or so. Um, when we get older than that, this cribriform plate deteriorates, right? And it's it's well known that, you know, smell goes down with age. We've done that with 560 people. And we, we've shown very nicely yeah. that, um, you know, there's a loss of smell, a gradual loss until you hit the 50s. And then it sort of picks up quite a bit. Some people still have good smell into older age, but that has to do with the genetics of what's the shape of the cribriform plate because it's it's variable in different people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the health of... of olfaction and, and regenerative capacity because that's one of the few areas that regenerates in the brain um and so that you know it's really an interesting evolutionary bent on it and yeah. i and i like i like to say that it, it's sort of fortuitous that that when i did my phd in vancouver you know there there's not a lot of money for grad school there so generally you have to be a teaching assistant and, uh, you know, big department, big zoology department. One of the things I was a teaching assistant for for a few years was comparative anatomy, right? Comparing the anatomy. Sure. Uh, there was a dissection lab with cats and rats and dogfish and a bunch of other things. But, but part of that was really to consolidate the knowledge of how these things fit together mm -hmm. and particularly uh, nervous system and, and brain evolution. So it was it's sort of uh, fortuitous for me to, to have that background and be able to look at it that way because not everyone has that opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Doug, you, you mentioned the 560 volunteers, and I know that was part of um, this kind of seminal paper that you published in, um, in 2021, uh, Impairment of CFS Egress to Cribriform Plate. Plays a typical role in Alzheimer's disease etiology, and, and in the paper is also a patholog pathological work that you did on on seventy uh, post mortem subjects, and there's also a, a ferret model in there. Talk talk about twenty twenty one a bit if you would, because then we'll head into LKD after that. Well, well, that's a few projects, and we have some more papers coming out this year uh, on that with some more details. I and and so you know what we what we did was. Um, I had this idea and I published this paper in 2014, which took a year plus to make it through review because it was sort of a different sure. perspective. It was suggesting that, you know, the cribriform plate and, and olfactory system, it might have something to do with, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it was more of a hypothesis paper. Um, and so uh, I got invited to, to give a talk on a longevity conference and um, gave a talk and went very well up in the Bay Area. And uh, they suggest, you know, a guy came by from Methuselah Foundation. He said, listen, we've got some some money. We'd love to support this project because it was just an idea at the time. I right. approached the NIH and sent grants in, but it doesn't fit in with the amyloid hypothesis. Sure. Who do you think you are telling us <laughs> we're wrong yeah, or might yeah. not be completely right? You know, we're from Harvard, for goodness sake. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, it was clear that the the NIH uh, approach was going to run into people because, you know, a study section has 20, 30 people. All, it only takes one person to say, uh, oh, I'm not so sure about this. And, and that's the end of it, of uh, the grant. So I, I was sort of, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with it. And so um, the Methuselah Foundation came up and they said, listen, we we'd like to support this, you know, first with a little money and then we'll talk. Uh, but we don't want it to go to a university administrator who's going to spend it on staples and parking and whatever. Sure. We want you to start a company. And so I I, I thought about it and it, it seemed like a good idea. I'd sort of had an entrepreneurial itch for, for a while. And I started Leukemia Therapeutics as, uh, as a virtual company while I was still a professor. And so what we did with that initial money was we had a collaborator who sent us uh, um, pieces of cribriform plate pathologist who sent us pieces of cribriform plate and we did some high resolution scanning we tried a couple different ways ucla and U usc and eventually we got a, a very high resolution approach to scanning this structure because the cribriform plate believe it or not it's kind of been ignored in anatomy i mean arguably 2500 years of human anatomy from from Vitruvius, 
right vitruvian man is based mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. roman general vitruvius who started measuring the length of arms and fingers and things like that um so human anatomy arguably goes back that way and and the cribriform plates you know it's kind of right between your eyes uh a little above and um it's, it's kind of center central to the skull but it was depicted at the time almost comically right because the the textbooks i had seen it was it was depicted either as like a solid brick mm. with a bone with like vertical holes that had nerves going through it or it was a piece of paper with random holes mm. and, and i was like well uh, let's take a look at this structure so right. we did this study with eventually 70 postmortem samples and we did high resolution uh, micro ct imaging uh, which got us you know very high resolution of the bone and at the time 3d printing was really coming along okay. and so we 3d printed one of them and I'm, I'm sort of holding it up and i'm like these aren't just little vertical things these are like tubes at angles mm -hmm. right and then we you know did more and more of those and we also came through with a way to to look at the soft tissues so we could actually see you know where the nerves where the blood vessels you know what's in the what is in each aperture and so that was it was very helpful and we sort of uh, spent some time on that and it became very clear that the structure was very different than any of the textbooks and that also led to an understanding of the CSF flow channels mm -hmm. and how they go through. And so, you know, it, it fit in also some of the samples we had were Alzheimer's cases and they had kind of unusual cribriform plates. Some of them were, you know, almost completely occluded. So the apertures were, were occluded and we were like, well, you know, that's, this is, this is great. This supports our hypothesis, but we need a little bit more evidence because as my statistics professor would would say a correlation does not imply causality so how do we show that disrupting the cribriform plate is going to affect this there's some evidence that you know taking the uh, olfactory bulb out of animals will cause depression and some things like that but what we wanted to know was if we disrupted the cribriform plate what would happen so we we blocked the cribriform plate in the in the um in some ferrets from the mm -hmm. nasal side so it didn't go mm -hmm. into the brain just went in the, the the sinus and sort of pulled the tissue back and used dental semantic to, to fill up those holes in about half of the, the apertures and so the ferrets were fine they're playing in the cage within 20 minutes after surgery went and played with their uh, the rest of the colony but when we looked at at how they did in a tunnel maze things started to emerge because remember mm -hmm. you know you you lose the orientation in three-dimensional space and so what we would do is we made a, a tunnel maze because there was really no way to do this before so we kind of invented this maze where we took um drainage pipes four four inch drainage pipes and they would go through and they'd have to figure out make a left turn or a right turn they turn the wrong way and then they, it takes a circle back to where they were mm -hmm. so you have to make three right turns or three left turns depending on the day to get out of the maze and so it's normal for ferrets to chase rabbits down holes, down tunnels. So it's it's a behavior that they, they kind of like to do. And so they, they go through the maze and then they get to the other side and then we bring them out and, and it, it's all great. Um, and so the first time they go through the maze, they have really no idea how to get out. And it takes them a little while. And one of the things that was very interesting is that the ferrets who didn't have the occlusion um mm -hmm. after a little while they would you know not know how to get out it would take them a few minutes and so they'd have like a little squeak for their for their friends you know hey can you find me where 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 is everybody right right so it's, it's a little bit of an anxiety thing and um after a while the uh the occluded cribriform plate ferrets they didn't make that sound anymore in mm -hmm. fact they weren't stressed about much of anything we I kind of call them like stoner surfers. They were gotcha. just calm. They they wouldn't try to bite us or anything because we have to handle them with with thick gloves. And then uh, finding their way through the maze, progressively what happened from two to six months after this occlusion is that the ferrets 
that had um, the occluded cribriform plate, they got worse and worse at navigating mm. the space. They had a progressive memory deficit, spatial memory deficit. Um, as opposed to the control animals where they just kind of figured out how to solve the maze. So they got better and better at solving the maze. So we have a behavioral change uh, in terms of emotional um, anxiety, which is related to the amygdala. We have a spatial change related to the hippocampus. And then when we looked at the anatomy, we saw that the animals had a, a big reduction in the size of the medial temporal lobe equivalent in, in yeah. ferrets. Um, of 40%. So, I mean, there's significant atrophy of this structure, which is some distance away from the olfactory bulb, right? So it's yeah. not right where the injury is. It's sort of right. there's like fiber bundle that connects to it. And the fiber bundle is actually smaller as well. So it added quite a bit of support to the hypothesis for mm -hmm. us that, you know, if, if there's a disruption, whether it's an injury it's a toxin that kills the odor receptors. It's aging of the cribriform plate. If you have disruption of that, it's going to contribute to some atrophy of this important area where really the Alzheimer's fire starts. And so then, you know, going back to humans, what we wanted to know was, well, uh, can we figure out who's who, right? Because postmortem samples, the, they go into no. a machine that has blast with enormous radiation for two hours, but it's a little piece of bone. And how do you do that with, with a human? And so we wanted to image the cribriform plates. We started something called Project Cribros. Now it's right. ongoing. We haven't restarted it because we got up to 560 people when COVID hit. Yeah. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, it was a week before everything shut down. And I was like, this, this is an infection. We have older people coming in here. We can't have this. We have to stop right now and so we we did and we put it on hold and we will restart it again but we did get to 560 subjects yeah um, now which was an enormous amount of data for us to look at during during covid and when the subjects came in um you know of course they signed informed consent and that to participate in the study and then they would sit in a scanner uh a ct scanner to to get uh, an image of the cribriform plate. Now, this isn't one of the, the ones in a hospital where you lie in a gurney. It's actually a dental scanner. So you sit in a chair because dental scanners are cone beam. They're low resolution or low dose machines that sort of go around your head mm -hmm. and they're designed to resolve something about the size of a large tooth, which happens to be about the size of the cribriform plate. So it was perfect for us. It took us a while to figure out how to do this. And so we got the scans and then uh, the subjects would take um, an odor test, right? They would have 10 cards, which uh, we developed. And there's a little sticker. You take the sticker, you sniff it. And then there's four options. You, you know, check one of the boxes. And so you have 10 of those cards. And in that way, we we're actually able to see, you know, very clearly the decline in olfaction that sort of accelerates when you hit 50 or so. I mean, there was some data before, but now we have our own data quite a bit. And then the other thing we wanted to test was uh, cognition and memory. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there's a, a couple ways to do this. Typically, there's a mini mental status exam, which a doctor would do. It would be, you know, give you five things to remember, like an apple, a pencil, a comb, mm -hmm. things like that. And then ask you about it a few minutes later. Now, that's very useful, but it's somewhat crude and certainly more crude than we wanted. The other one that's around is, is called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And it's uh, the piece of paper um, that, you know, they sit there with a pencil and they connect lines and uh, there's some word puzzles, well, word queries, shall we say. And uh, so it's one sheet of paper and it's a very static thing. So the, they fill that out and then they also have the, the five things to remember for 10 or so minutes. Um, and so we, we wanted to improve that because we were going to have a number of people coming through and I, I thought we could do better. Uh, we, we looked into some companies that have made things and ridiculous amounts of money for that. And I was like, well, you know, I, I understand how this test works. Maybe we can make it a little more engaging, particularly for older people who, who might enjoy doing it a different way. So what we did 
was we uh, made it uh, with the game engines. We actually made it with three different game engines. Um, so for video games. So mm -hmm. the, the test itself is on a, like a screen uh, of a computer screen. It's a touch screen. Okay. Right? And it's, it's intentionally not very verbal. Right. So it's not so much word puzzles. There is a word puzzle. Semantic um, testing is, is part of it. But other things are like, uh, you know, randomness, right? You go A1, B2, C3, and you connect those together. Can you alternate between two tasks, right? Can you identify things? If you have different blocks of different colors, can you pick out a specific block, right? If you have, um, can you identify objects? And so that that was my personal favorite one is, is identifying objects. So... Mm -hmm. What we did was uh, I drew basically silhouettes of animals. So you could see it was an elephant, it was a lion, it was a dog or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you see three of these on a bright yellow background, three of these tiles. And then, you know, it goes away. And then you have 12 of them presented. Well, which three did you see? Right. And so you touch the screen. So it's, it's more like a video game. Mm -hmm. So what we would do in this is we wanted to test uh, spatial memory. And so what we did was make little video animations where you're walking through uh, a hallway or a building or outside somewhere. Um, and you come up with a few doors, three to five doors. And one of them is the right answer. So, you know, at the beginning of the game, you have no idea which one's the right. So they just touch them and then, oh, oh, that's that one. But then they do another maze and it's three to five doors. They do it again. So they do five mazes and then they go do like the animal thing or one of the other puzzles and they come back and they do the five mazes again mm -hmm. and so the test takes about 15 to 20 minutes and the fourth and fifth time they see the mazes people are starting to catch on at the beginning people are like what i i don't understand what's going on and then they start to realize that certain environments the right solution is door x right so people go through and they they get better and we actually scramble up the order of the mazes a little bit. Um, and so the fourth and fifth time they go through is a very good indicator of how well they remember this door is the right solution for this environment. Mm -hmm. right. And so that, that was a great test. So we we basically covered everything that's in the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and then we built upon that as well, right? We tested those parameters, and it's nice because it's also digital, so we know if somebody made a wrong error, how long it takes them to right, make the right error. And so that's really a way for us to gauge where people um, are cognitively. Mm -hmm. And then, of, of course, we have to put all this data together, and that was fortunate that we were you know, we had all this data during the COVID lockdown because we we dove right into the machine learning component of this study mm -hmm. and we had to come up with a, a way to process the images because the cribriform plate is very thin and wispy at times. And, we, you know, we have to make sure that we're getting the right bone. We can't sit there and, and hand manually segment right. where the bone is and isn't. So we had to develop the, the deep learning algorithm to do that, which mm -hmm. which works uh, quite well. And then also how to do, there, there's a way to do multi-mode, uh, multi-input, like multi-mode, different types of data that you can integrate together. For example, the, the, uh, the sensory data, the smell data, the, uh, morphology data, the, the memory test data, and also some questions we ask them about, you know, you know, have you ever had a head injury? Is your family history of Alzheimer's? Things like that. Mm -hmm. So to put all that data together is a, like a different type of machine learning that we we had to work on. And and those questions that we ask are are quite important because one of the things we found in our studies of cribriform plate is a, a lot of people have had sort of a deviated septum, and the cribriform plate there, there's a structure in the middle that's directly connected to that. So if you break your nose it sort of causes damage to the cribriform plate. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you get hit in the face with a hockey puck or something. They, oh, wipe the blood off. You're fine. Just get yeah. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think about it. Um, 
But it seems to be that some people have damage to the cribriform plate that lasts a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is you're getting ossification of this and sort of slowly right. close the apertures in some people. And if you have an injury to that, even a childhood injury, particularly a young injury, um, there's a, a propensity for there to be mo more bone deposition in response, right? Mm -hmm. If you break your arm, the site of the breakage will generally have more bone after it heals. Right, right, right. And, and so it's sort of relevant and it might explain why head injuries are correlated with a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Where, you know, there's certainly, there's a possibility other mechanisms are involved, but we're really interested in, you know, in this head injury. Was it, you know, hitting their their face into a windshield or or something like that, some traumatic event that could have damaged the cribriform plate. And so we're we're working on some epidemiology studies to figure out, you know, what's the correlation between these things. But yeah. but it, you know, it all of the pieces have sort of fallen into place and yeah. and uh, and we're we're quite happy. Yeah, no, it's uh it's been an amazing set of uh of of projects there that I said uh, the, the 2021 paper sort of brings it all together for folks listening if you want to download that one and take a look oh and, uh, and sorry to interrupt I, no, go ahead. um if if you want to take this test and play some of the games that we did you can do it for free mm -hmm. we put it on to uh we, we put on to google and apple but google's a little difficult sometimes with with when you're putting a game on so we put mm -hmm eight of the games onto the Apple App Store. And so they're yeah. free to download. They're called Procogny. Procogny, yeah. P-R-O-C-O-G-N-Y. And so there, some of them are just, you know, silly little puzzles that you can play and they're they're free. Um, if you want to get like the special extra level or something, you can pay like a dollar or two. But yeah, the, so I was I was going to mention in the, the uh, we'll, we'll put that in the bio of the show that, uh, that you guys launched those apps um recently but that yeah that i appreciate bringing that up so yeah that's yeah well well the the cognitive test there's one called the memory tracker where it'll right, right, right. You have these little puzzles in the morning and and in there there's memory test so, uh, yeah. i think it's called memory test it was a while ago since it. i looked at it but you can go through but if you're going to take that you need to allocate a good 20 minutes to do it because you can't take a little bit and then go have coffee and come back because it's testing you know how you remember things over time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so you need to you know get a cup of coffee well probably not coffee mm -hmm. uh, because you really don't want to be hyped up on caffeine it's not going to give you a true response gotcha. uh, but, but you can go through and, and sort of see what we're up to and at the end it'll plot how you did compared to other people your age so make sure you put in your real age we we have no idea of figuring out who you are you can put in any name you like and we we just we just want to know what country it comes from but we don't right. We don't track individual data at all. Gotcha. Got it. Um, Doug, take us uh, take us into the status of uh, Arathusta uh, and the device. And uh, now that you know you have this um, amazing basket of evidence, you're developing the device to help ultimately drain the CSF more efficiently, quicker. Um, what, where are we in 2023? Uh, what's the status of the project? And I know you're developing as a medical device. Uh, take us through a little bit of, uh, of that. Well, it's it's been an, an interesting venture for me to go from being a biologist to developing a, a medical device. And I, cool. it's great to have some uh, bioengineers working with me on that and neurosurgeons. Um, and what we're, we're really doing is say, what well, we my hypothesis is that we have a plumbing problem, right? And the easy way to fix that would be to take the fluid that's above the cribriform plate and put it somewhere else. Um, and so we've developed Arethusta, which is a little device. I, I don't know if I should mention this, but Arethusta is sort of a play on words. There's a, a Greek water nymph uh, called Arethusa, and she was um, uh, attracted the amorous uh, attention of a river god, uh, and then, uh, so she appealed to Artemis for help, and Artemis turned her into a hidden underground stream. So, Arthusa, oh, yeah. Arthusa. Oh, you hate when those river gods cause trouble. I, I... <laughs> those guys, man, okay. toxic masculinity. That's... <laughs> um, but ancient Greek times, it was a different time, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so the idea is to to shut this away, and and our 
solution to that is to keep it all within the body. So the, the nasal cavity uh, has a lot of lymphatic structures, right? You know, you get a cold, you can mm -hmm. clear it very quickly. Nasal vaccines, there's quite a bit of, of uh, uh, lymphatic structure in there. And so what we want to do is basically take it through the cribriform plane, take it into the lymphatic field and release it very slowly, right? Because we can't just make a hole. That would be very bad. In fact, right. sometimes that happens in a car accident. Somebody will crack the cribriform plate and they'll have CSF leaking out their nose, mm -hmm. which causes dizziness and headaches. And uh, it'll resolve itself soon, usually. But if it doesn't, it's a medical emergency because there's a chance of pathogens going into the brain. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to get CSF out in a regulated way, in such a way that we don't have the possibility of it flowing back so we don't get pathogens going into the brain. Right. And we've engineered this device. We had the first device, which sounded great, looked great. But then, you know, we wanted to make sure that we address these safety issues. And so now uh, the current version of the device is uh, is being manufactured by um, some contractors because it has to be made in certain facilities, you know, certified facilities from certified materials. Sure. And, and we should have the all the components together um in the next few months and so then we approach the fda and we say well we want to we want to put this into people and and initially what we'll do is a, a small study of 20 25 people yep. uh, for safety in probably here in california um and uh we'll once we have safety data of that. We can expand the study and have different sites. So the initial one we're, we're going to do here is in Colton, which is close to Palm Springs. And then we'll, we'll probably have a second site up in Santa Clara and Bay Area and uh, maybe others, other sites elsewhere. Ultimately, we'll have to have about 150 people get the device mm -hmm. and um, for just for the trial. And But what, one of the things we're going to look for first is not so much Alzheimer's, but the precursor to that, which is a mild cognitive impairment right. that's consistent with early Alzheimer's. So obviously we're going to look at the cribriform plate um, structures and uh, memory testing, and we'll also have to bring in probably some of the standard methodologies that are used to assess Alzheimer's patients. And so we'll put those together and we'll have our subjects primarily from the Project Gribros pool. Um, and so we'll have controls, we'll have people who get the device. And people who get the device originally, initially, will have mild to moderate cognitive impairment. Okay. And so what's happening at that stage is it's before the horse is out of the barn, right? It's, it's a slew basically for the cells in the medial temporal lobe because mm -hmm. things are building up, but it hasn't quite just exploded and spread to the rest of the brain. So if we put the device in, it should drain that slew uh, and allow rejuvenation of the interstitial fluid in those areas. And so those neurons that are not firing very well for spatial temporal memory or the amygdala, um, they should recover because they haven't haven't really died yet. Died. Uh, well, maybe some of them died, but they're stressed. They're making neurofibrillary tangles. There's maybe deposits of A-beta around, but there's also other factors that are in there that are not friendly, not conducive to the survival of neurons. Right. But if we take that away, uh, suddenly we expect those synapses to recover in a matter of weeks to months, nice. right? So we should have uh, a decline in their impairment. Right, the mild to moderate moderate cognitive impairment should go down to near baseline uh, very quickly. So if we follow them for a year, we should get a pretty good idea of are there any adverse effects? Are, is there a beneficial effect on cognition for MCI connected with early Alzheimer's? Now, we have to be very careful about who we select because probably 20% of seniors have some form of mild cognitive impairment. And we're only interested in the ones that have problems with the cribriform plate and are are fit within these parameters. And this cool. is part of the project Cribros, you know, building it so that we can figure out who should get the device. Right. So we want to put that in first and then 
it'll take us, you know, six months, maybe a year to put it into all of the subjects, the first set of subjects. But then uh, a year after that, we'll have one year data for enough subjects to say, well, you know, this is looking pretty good. So when the statistics have enough subjects, we'll be able to say, well, this device uh, improves the memory, re reduces the cognitive impairment in this specific group of subjects, right? Mm -hmm. So that will be the first thing we go to the FDA and say, well, we would like to market our device to treat the specific set of subjects sure. like this. Now, we'll, we'll, of course, have it in 150 or, or more subjects, hopefully. Now, for Alzheimer's, what we're doing is basically just following those subjects longer because we'll have a control group the same size as our experimental group. And the control group, they're going to start getting Alzheimer's disease because they haven't had the intervention. Right. right? So if the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is significantly higher in the control group compared to our treated group, Right. Yeah. And if that, you know, happens in two years, three years, five years, um, then we can go to the FDA or other regulators in the EU and we can say um, we would like to market this device as a treatment for or prevention for Alzheimer's disease. Right. And so that's what we have to do. And one of the advantages of a medical device is that it's much faster and cheaper than yeah. a drug. Yeah. So a new Alzheimer's drug will take a billion dollars to get through phase clinical three clinical trials. And it'll probably take a decade or longer to do that versus, you know, our approach is, is significantly less and, and much faster. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm hoping it works quite well, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's where it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. I and mean, I, I love to, you know, once again, going back to, what we talked about at the beginning in terms of the permissive and restrictive environments and the concept that, you know, once you get this stuff out of the way that, uh, you know, it, there, there is the potential for that regenerative uh, dynamic in the brain and, 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 uh, and recovery in that way. Um, the, the medical device path. Yeah, obviously, I mean, that's, that, that's just another uh, really, really important piece. That's why I wanted to stress that compared to traditional drug development. Um, I, I, obviously I know, I know, you know, obviously, you know, you, you weren't, you succeed at this Alzheimer's slash dementia thing. And, you know, you, you're going to be one of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, that being said, um, you know, you could swap out Alzheimer's and plug in Parkinson's and Huntington's and prion disease and also other stuff that junk <laughs> is responsible for um other targets uh that you start you, know, you daydream about as <laughs> as you think about you know the billions that are going to be coming in from the measure well yeah. well devices aren't as well protected as drugs so i'm sure it won't be it won't be long once we're successful there will be wolves <laughs> at the door quickly but um but yeah at least you know the, the idea is that we we cure this disease or at least make a big big impact on the disease but um i yeah i i you sort of read my mind there because i think that problems with csf clearance of the brain right the interstitial flow are also related to other aging related cognitive defects yeah. and, and the big one uh, is often also confused with alzheimer's disease in fact i think it's something like 90 percent of people with with uh, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is treatable, are misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So what, what happens is, is in these people, um, more CSF is made and retained in the ventricles, you know, the chambers in the middle of the brain, there are four right. of them, um, then, then gets out. So what happens is it, it sort of presses on the cortex and it causes a triad of symbols, uh, symptoms. Right. It causes ataxia. So they have problems walking. So, you know, unstable gait. Yeah. They have continence. So they just can't control their urinary function and uh, confusion. Right. So they get these things. And I think it's very much related to not producing. It's not a case of producing too much CSF. It's a case of most of the CSF that's made um, has to percolate through the tissue. Right. Some of it goes flows through the, the ventricles, but that's really just to maintain their size and shape. Got it. Um, so what happens in normal pressure hydrocephalus is I think that it's 
it's sort of the same thing. The the interstitial spaces and you know the cerebrum, the much larger area than the medial temporal lobe, it's slowly accumulating diffuse plaques of amyloid and other things that are slowing the flow of fluid out there. And and the effect of that is that more and more fluid is retained in the ventricles. Got it. So if we can drain on the other side of the brain, or on the other side in the subarachnoid space, it would probably be a, a little better than the current strategy, which is to drain from the ventricle, right? Because the ventricle is the newly made, pristine, perfect CSF, right? And we don't want to drain that away. We want to drain the crud that's in the subarachnoid space after it's gone through and cleared away all this stuff. And so I think there's an opportunity for, for erythusta to also be used in treating normal pressure hydrocephalus and probably some other uh, aging things. But I, I don't want to talk too much about that. But yeah, I, I absolutely think, you know, it could be if it works for Alzheimer's, even if it only works for you know, delaying Alzheimer's for five years, it would be an enormous benefit um, to the field. And um, yeah, so we, we will probably try it in other things as well. I, I like to think it's it's almost like a pacemaker, you know, where if if you were in a world where the pacemaker hadn't been invented, right? And yeah. some guy comes up to you, wild lab scientist and says, you know what, I've got this little plastic battery thing here we're going to put it in the chest and we're going to stick these electrodes into the heart it's going to save millions of lives a year uh, you know the vcs would go well there must be a drug for that we'll, right, we'll give right. you like a hundred million dollars to develop a drug for that Ooh, yeah, who's yeah. gonna who's gonna have electrodes stuck into their heart nobody's going to do that <laughs> and so that's sort of some of the stuff with their it's like well who's going to have a you know a thing put into their brain it's like well if it's a choice of that or, um, you know, losing your mind and, and personality, um, yeah, I think most people will take it, particularly since know it, it. it'll be a procedure that's sort of under twilight anesthesia, like a, yep. um, like a wisdom tooth extraction. You know, you're not completely out. You're just sort of, you know, feeling good. Yep. And it, the neurosurgeons who, who've put it in um, to samples, shall we say, um, you know, they put it in like 10, 15 minutes. So it's it's not a, a big major thing. They don't have to go into the brain and pull stuff back. It's just going through the nasal cavity. But yeah. so I, I think it might be, you know, if it's successful for Alzheimer's and MCI and normal pressure hydrocephalus, it might just be something that a lot of people get. Um, and, you know, you're just walking walking through, getting on with your life. Um, that's the hope. I'm I'm getting up into that age range as well, so I have a vested interest in this thing working. Aren't we? Aren't we all? <laughs> uh, so before before I let you go, um, I just you know, tell us just a couple minutes about um, you know why you uh, why you wrote the book. Uh, and you wrote it as a novel, um, and, and then I, I noticed that the uh, one of the main characters' name is Elena Banting, and I, just, I don't know if that was any connection to the. Uh, the diabetes banting and best it is, guys. It, oh, it guys. is. very hey. good I right yes absolutely listen. yeah okay yeah okay. well i you know i i've been working on this for for years and and um um i'm always trying to explain it you know, explain it to my my parents who have really no medical background and and friends and 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 other colleagues and it takes a few minutes to sort of explain it i mean it's great we've had an hour here to to go over it and I was thinking, well, there must be some way to um, to do this I, because you know, if I just write a nonfiction book, uh, that's basically what I write through my whole career is just this okay. technical nonfiction. And I I know if it's something outside of my area, it's it's harder to wade through. And even if I read scientific stuff all the time, so I thought, well, let's make something accessible. Um, and uh, you know, Michael Crichton was one of my favorite authors. You know, oh, he's yeah. read a bunch of great stuff. And and I, you know, I've always felt that the human brain is hardwired for narrative structure, right? I mean, campfire stories, you know, whatever it is, people will listen to a story for hours. Yep. But if you're lecturing them about, you know, arcane human anatomy, you've got maybe two minutes before they're looking around for somebody else to talk to. So I, I thought, well, 
can I do that? So we'll put it in there. And and part of it is that there needs to be a little conversation to explain it. So, you know, some of the characters are interacting and having little exchanges in the coffee shop where they're sort of laying it out. And I I I appreciate that you you got the I don't know if you got the book, but um there's pictures which I online, yeah. Yeah. Well there's uh, yeah. Uh yeah. There's some pictures. Yep. yep. A little drawing. So I, I'd worked on this for a little bit, kind of on the side for a few years. And then uh, this COVID thing happened. Maybe you heard about it. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, had a little extra time. So we're doing machine learning, but, you know, it's got to be left brain, right brain balance. I have to look a little artistic stuff with yep. the technical. So um, so I was able to finish this off uh, during COVID and, and get it out there. But I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I, I, uh, I think you know, the smart people will tell you we this space, whether it's you know, biotech or health tech in general. I mean, we need more good stories. Um, and we know we're telling alongside, as you were just saying, and um, I think it's great what you've done there, and in, in terms of sort of merging both worlds. So I, I think you no, know, uh, I'm really, I'm really excited for everything you're doing, Doug. I mean, I um, just it's it's been very impressive. Last few years, I know COVID's gotten in the way, but um, you know, really, really rooting you on with this one um, because it is such a such an important unmet need, and um, yeah, I'm glad you're on this path with it. Um, again, for everybody that's going to be listening uh, to this episode of our uh, show uh, across the various podcast networks or or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. Doug Athel founder and chief executive officer, Lucadia Therapeutics. Uh, check out uh, procogni.com. Uh, we'll put a link in the uh, in the bio in terms of uh, checking out their uh, different online tests. Uh, pick up a copy of uh, Remembering Apples, A Race to Cure Alzheimer's Disease, available on Amazon and all of the booksellers. Um, Doug, I, I want to thank you, really, for taking the time out to walk us through this amazing story. Um, obviously, Thank you. Thank you for being involved in it to the level you are and doing what you're doing. And as we like to say on our show here, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via so many people out there, via the work you've been doing and, and continue to do. It's really, really great story. Well, thanks very much for having me, Ira. It's been a pleasure. Good seeing you.